Hello everyone, today's webinar will begin in approximately two minutes. Thank you. Welcome everyone, I'm Steve Mayers and I'm going to be sharing some logistical and webinar platform information with you before we get started with today's presentation. Next slide, please. In order to take full advantage of the webinar technology, we recommend viewing the presentation through the Chrome browser. If you have experienced technical problems, please review the technology FAQs document that is available by clicking on the chat icon at the bottom of your screen or on the landing page, a pop-up will appear and you will see a link titled Technology FAQ. Download the document and review the guidance. If that doesn't resolve the issue, you can submit an electronic request for assistance by clicking on the Contact Tech Support tab and a tech support representative will respond. Next slide, please. This webinar is being recorded for future viewing on HUD Exchange and all attendees are in listen-only mode. If you'd like a copy of today's PowerPoint deck, you can find it on the HUD Exchange or by clicking on the chat icon or landing page, then click on the Webinar Documents and Materials tab to download the document. At the end of the presentation, you will be directed to the landing page where the webinar documents and materials are available for download. Next slide. We will have a question and answer session immediately following the presentation. The presentation team will respond to questions typed into the Q&A tab during the presentation and will answer questions as time permits. If you have unanswered questions about the content of today's presentation, please send an email to housing.counseling at hud.gov. Next slide, please. And that concludes the housekeeping overview. We will now start the presentation. On behalf of HUD's Office of Housing Counseling and the Department of Education, I would like to welcome you to our webinar, Reducing Student Debt Through the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, with Terry Carr, Senior Policy Advisor HUD, providing opening remarks. Terry will be followed by the Department of Education's Ashley Harrington, Senior Advisor, Federal Student Aid. Terry, please begin when you're ready. Hi, and thank you for joining us to find out more about this, the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. During this webinar, you'll learn some new details and new updates about the program. The webinar was originally intended for HUD housing counselors as a training. However, given the importance of the information, we've worked hard to expand the audience. More than a thousand people have registered for today's webinar, and it's a testament to the importance of this information. About 43 million people have student loan debt, and the outstanding balance of debt in total is about $1.8 trillion. So the issue affects a lot of people and has a tremendous effect on our economy. So we promoted this webinar among many different groups. 
HUD employees, federal employees of other agencies. We worked with the Office of Housing, the Office of Housing Counseling worked with OCHICO, the Financial Literacy and Education Commission, and of course, the Department of Education to bring this information to you. We hope it will help you. And for our counselors, we hope it will help you help your clients. Now I wanna turn it over to Ashley Harrington, the Senior Advisor from the Department of Education who will present this information. Thanks. Ashley, next slide. Thanks so much, Terry, um, and thanks so much to you and your team at HUD for putting this together and working with us on this. I'm really excited to share this information with everyone here today. Um, I, I was introduced, but I'm also joined by my colleague, Bonnie Luttrell, our federal student ombudsman, and my colleague, Caitlin Vitez, who is um, who leads a lot of our outreach for higher education for Department of Ed. And they're going to join me by helping answer some questions in the Q&A box. Please use that to answer your questions. They're going to answer questions in real time. We'll go through a lot of information today. We'll spend some time with FAQs and examples, and then we'll have time to answer some of your questions out loud um, at the end of the webinar as well. So um, bear with us. It's a lot of information. We hope it's helpful both for you and for the folks that you know in your networks of people you interact with. So please share it far and wide. Things that we're going to talk about today are exciting and transformative, and we really think they're, they've already helped a ton of borrowers, and they can also help a bunch of you and folks that you know. So please um, take advantage of this, of this program, of this waiver that we're going to talk about, and take advantage of this information. You already have the PowerPoint for, that you can take with you and share with other folks as well. Um, so let's jump in. Next slide. So we're going to talk about the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Limited Waiver today, and we're going to, I'm going to delve into that in detail, but I wanted to flag that this is part of this administration's efforts at providing targeted student loan relief. And it has resulted in a lot of cancel, a lot of the approval of tons of cancellation. We're actually at more than 30 billion now. We recently announced earlier this week um, additional um, debt relief provided to former students of ITT. Um, so I haven't updated this slide yet, but bear with me. We're at we're at over 30 billion. Um, I think 1.6 million borrowers, and that includes over nine and a half billion in approved and forgiveness for 175,000 public servants through improvements to PSLF that we're going to talk about today. Next slide. In addition to the 9.5 billion that is improved, that has been approved for forgiveness for those 175,000 borrowers, another million plus borrowers have gotten closer to forgiveness with the average borrower picking up a year's worth of additional credit. That's 12 months of additional credit towards the 120 required for PSLF. So this is a game changer. And when I say that, I mean it, it's transformative. It has changed the lives of so many people with so many people to come who will also be impacted. Next slide. Okay, so I just wanna go through what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to start by talking about the PSLF basics. So that's how public service loan forgiveness normally works. Um, while that's not how it works right now, it's important to have that baseline. So we're all starting from the same place before we talk about the limited PSLF waiver. Then we're gonna talk about that waiver. We're gonna talk about the PSLF help tool, which is what you should use to apply for PSLF. Then we're gonna spend a little bit of time on resources. We'll spend some time on some frequently asked questions to help us walk through some of the things we went through today. And then we'll do some live Q and A. Next slide. Next slide. So let's start with the basics, right? Many of you may have heard of PSLF before. You know about public service loan forgiveness or you think you've heard something, but let's just do a quick recap. So the PSLF program was created by Congress in October of 2007 and it forgives the remaining balance on federal direct student loans after a borrower has made 120 qualifying monthly payments under a qualifying repayment plan while working full-time for a qualifying employer. Next slide. So this is a visual that walks you through what I just said. You make 120 qualifying payments on federal direct student loans while you're working for a qualifying employer when you're applying for and receiving PSLF. Again, we're talking about normal PSLF rules. And at the end, whatever you have left over is forgiven and it's not taxable income. So over the past couple of slides, you've heard me say qualifying quite a bit. And that is where the issues have arisen in PSLF over the years, because so many borrowers don't know what qualifying means or haven't known. And it's been confusing and changed and things like that. So we're going to go through each of those pieces because the FSA, we like to say, instead of qualifying, you have to have the right loan with the right repayment with the right job. Next slide. So let's start with the right loan. What counts as an eligible loan for PSLF? It's direct loans, federal direct student loans. This does include consolidation loans and parent plus loans, but we'll talk about those a little bit more in a second. And so direct loans are those that are originated directly by the federal government. And they say direct in their title. 
it doesn't include something called FELL program loans. These are federal family education program loans. These are loans that were originated by private institutions, but guaranteed by the federal government. So they may have been originated by someone like Sally May or Wells Fargo, a private lender. It also doesn't include Perkins loans. These are loans that are originated by institutions of higher education and guaranteed by the federal government. And it didn't include any other federal or private student loan. And what's interesting is that back when Congress created this program in October, 2007, it was, it's only for direct loans, but the bigger loan program was the FELL program. There were more FELL borrowers than direct borrowers at the time. So there were all these borrowers who existed when they created this program, but couldn't take advantage of the waiver. We no longer make FEL, lo FEL program loans as of 2010, but there are still a ton of FEL borrowers out there. And FEL borrowers and Perkins borrowers, and if you have some other type of federal student loan, have always had the ability to consolidate. You can consolidate into the direct loan program, and then you'll have a direct consolidation loan. And once you do that, you can work towards PSLF. But doing that, does you don't get any credit for the time prior to consolidation. So plenty of folks have been in repayment for years, and if they consolidated, they would start at zero. Even if they had direct loans that consolidated for some reason, they would lose their credit and they would start at zero. And so that's how it normally works under PSLF and that's where a lot of the frustration came about. Next slide. So what counts as the right repayment, right? It has to be on time. It can't it has to be on a standard plan or any income driven repayment plan. You may hear me say IDR, IBR for income driven repayment interchangeably. I just mean the plans that we have that are based on a borrower's income. The payment has to be for at least the amount due and it can be non-consecutive. So you don't have to do 120 payments in a straight line in a row. It can take you exactly 10 years to get to 120. It can take you 15 years to get to 120 because you take time off or you go to the private sector or you take time to start a family, right? It can take you 200, it can take you 20 years to get to 120. It doesn't matter because it doesn't have to be consecutive. Under normal rules, what doesn't count as an eligible payment for the 120? It can't be more than 15 days late. It can be made on a graduated, extended, or alternative payment plan. It can be for less than the amount due, and it can't be made when not required. So if you're in school and your loans are deferred, or you're in that grace period following when you leave school and you make a payment, those payments don't count towards the 120. Next slide. So you can do multiple payments in one month and have that count as long as it adds up to the amount due and it's paid within 15 days of the due date. So if my payment is $100 for the month and it's due on the 15th and I pay $50 on the 5th and the other 50 on the 15th, I've met my obligation and that, that month counts towards the 120. We also do accept lump sum payments, but it's limited to 12 months or until your IDR plan recertification date because you do have to recertify your income every year for IDR. And remember, just because you do a lump sum payment doesn't mean you get forgiveness early because you're still going to have to work in that qualifying employment for the, hundred, for the corresponding months as well. Next slide. So just a quick note on Parent PLUS loans, because I did flag that they are eligible for PSLF, and we get a lot of questions about this, right? What about Parent PLUS loans? What about Parent PLUS borrowers? So Parent PLUS borrowers are not excluded from PSLF, and it is based on the parent's employment, not the student's, because it's the parent's loan. So they're not excluded. But the thing about Parent PLUS loans is they're not eligible for all income-driven repayment plans. And for PSLF, you really want to be on an income-driven repayment plan because if you're on the standard plan for, for, our, for federal student loans, it's a 10-year plan where you are scheduled to pay off everything over 10 years because it's fully amortizing, right? So you want to be on an IDR plan so you actually have something to forgive at the end of your 120 months. But in order for a Parent PLUS borrower to get on an, on an income-driven repayment plan, they have to consolidate. Then once they have a direct consolidation loan with that underlying Parent PLUS, they now have access to one of the income-driven repayment plans. It's called ICR, Income Contingent Repayment, and it is the least generous of the IDR plans, but it's the only one available through to Parent PLUS borrowers when they consolidate. So we always advise Parent PLUS borrowers to think about what that means for them in the short term versus the long term, to use our loan simulator and game out what their payment might be and how that compares to payments they may have on a graduated or extended plan that may be lower and, and may be more affordable in the short term, though don't lead to forgiveness in the long term. Next slide. So we talked about the right loan. We talked about the right repayment. Now we're gonna talk about the right job. So what is eligible employment under PSLF? You have to be full-time, which we define as 30 hours a week or the equivalent for a government entity. So that's federal, state, local, tribal, or military. It includes all 501c3 nonprofits and it includes some other nonprofits if they provide a qualifying public service. It doesn't include part-time work if it doesn't add up to full-time. It doesn't include volunteer work. So if you're doing work but not getting paid, that doesn't count. 
It doesn't include any for-profit entities, no matter what you do for them. It doesn't include labor unions or partisan political organizations. Next slide. So we like to say it's about the employer. It's not about the job. We're not going to ask you what you do for that employer. We're not going to ask you how much money you make. We don't care about that. We just want to know who pays you, who's on your W-2, who's on your pay stub. And is it a government entity? Is it a 501c3 nonprofit? Or is it a nonprofit that provides another qualifying public service, which are things like public safety, emergency management, public health, early childhood education? And if it's one of those employers, it's an eligible PSLF employer. So it's about the employer. It's not about the job. You can have multiple part-time jobs that add up to full-time employment. And as long as there are, they are all PSLF eligible employers, you can get credit. So if I work 15 hours a week at a federal agency and 15 hours a week at a 501c3 nonprofit, I work full-time in public service and I can get credit for those months. Next slide. So there's also something called temporary expanded PSLF. And this provides loan forgiveness to people who don't qualify for PSLF only because some or all of their qualifying payments were made on the wrong plan. So this was created by Congress through appropriations and it's just for borrowers who couldn't get forgiveness because they had, been some, they had made some payments on extended, on extended or graduated plans. Next slide. I also wanna flag right now to make sure folks know that for many of us, we have had our payments paused since March of 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I wanna make sure everyone here knows that you can get credit for every single one of these months towards your 120 for PSLF. As long as you were still full-time employed in PSLF and you submit a PSLF form, which we're gonna talk about later, for that time, you can get credit for every single one of these months. I say it a couple of times because people never believe me because it sounds like it shouldn't be possible and it doesn't make sense. Even though you have not made a payment, since March of 2020, you can get credit for every single one of these months. And if you made payments because you thought you had to to get PSLF during this period, you can request that money back. You can request a refund from your servicer and still get credit for these months as long as you had that qualifying employment. Next slide. So that's how PSLF normally works. It, and we're gonna talk about the good stuff now, the limited public service waiver, loan forgiveness waiver, sorry. This is the exciting thing. This is the thing that's happening. Prior to this waiver, fewer than 7,000 people had gotten PSLF forgiveness. Now in less than a year, more than 175,000 borrowers have been approved for forgiveness. And we got there through these changes, through this PSLF waiver. It's just about these temporary changes we made. And we're making sure folks know about them and know that they are temporary because many borrowers are going to have to take steps to take advantage of these changes by October 31st of this year. So the first big takeaway I want you to take away from me is that this, this waiver ends October 31st of this year. And so if you wanna take advantage of it, you have to do whatever steps you need to take by then. So let's talk about the waiver. Next slide. So we announced this waiver October of last year and it's temporary changes to the program rules. So under the waiver, borrowers can get credit for past periods of repayment that normally don't qualify for PSLF. So you can get credit for any period of repayment, no matter the loan program, the repayment plan, whether you made a payment, made the payment on time or made it in full, we're not looking at any of that. We just wanna know, were you in active repayment status? And it's something we define very generously. We even include some periods of forbearances and deferments. And we're gonna talk about that later too. And the big thing is, when I say we don't care about loan program, we are giving borrowers credit for pre-consolidation time and repayment. So if you previously had Feller Perkins loans and you consolidate it, you can now get credit for the time prior to consolidation. And if you consolidate now because you still have those, those Perkins or Fell loans, you can get time for the, you can get credit for the time all the way up until consolidation. So you don't have to start at zero anymore. And that is the big change. That is how we get so many borrowers to forgiveness and so many borrowers closer to forgiveness. We didn't change anything about qualifying employment and what qualifies um, as a PSLF eligible employer. That is still the same. And so this, these changes are for borrowers with direct loans, people who have already consolidated into the direct loan program, and everyone who consolidates into the direct loan program by October 31st of this year. Next slide. We're going to dig in a little bit more. I know I said a lot there. So the big change, payments made prior to consolidation are now eligible. So whereas before we talked about how you consolidated and you started at zero, under the waiver, that is not the case. Under the waiver, you do not have to start at zero if you consolidate. So we're not looking at whether you were in a Fell or a Perkins loan. We're not looking at that. 
We don't care about what, what repayment plan you're on. So whereas before you needed to look at your account and be like, was I on an income driven repayment plan? Was it pay? Was it IBR? Was it repay? Under the waiver, we don't care. We are not looking at what repayment plan you're on. It does not matter. Doesn't matter the loan type with the exception of Parent Plus. Again, it's a little bit always different for Parent Plus and we'll talk about that next. We didn't change the employment requirements. You still have to have been employed full-time for a qualifying employer for every prior period of repayment that you're trying to get credit for. And so borrowers have to act now. If you still have non-direct loans, if you still have Feller Perkins loans, you can only get credit for those past payments if you consolidate into the direct con consolidation loan program and file a PSLF form by October 31st of this year. Because after that, these rules turn into a pumpkin and we go back to the normal PSLF and TEPSLF rules. Next slide. So you might fall into one of three groups, right? You might only have direct loans and, that, and you're in a good position if you only have direct loans. So the only thing you wanna do to make sure you're raising your hand is get at least one PSLF form in for an eligible PSLF employer prior to October of this year. That's what you wanna do. The only thing you might wanna think about if you have only direct loans is if you have some loans that have been in repayment a lot longer. So some of them have 80 months versus 60 months. You can consolidate them together under the waiver that entire consolidation loan would get those 80 payments. And so you could potentially get some of your loans, the newer ones forgiven sooner than you thought. But if your loans are pretty much the same and they're all direct, then all you wanna do is make sure you got a PSLF form in. If you already consolidate into the direct consolidation loan program, so you had fellow Perkins loans, but now you're consolidated, you wanna get forms in for the time prior to consolidation because now you can get credit for that time. And if you still have Feller Perkins loans, you have the most to do, right? Because you have to consolidate and get that form in by October 31st of this year. Next slide. So I want to pause a second, talk about Parent Plus loans again, because we talked about how Parent Plus loans are eligible for PSLF. They are eligible for PSLF. They are not eligible to get additional credit under the waiver. So we talked about how many Parent Plus borrowers to take advantage of PSLF had to consolidate. So they have direct consolidation loans with underlying Parent Plus. We also talked about how under the waiver, pre-consolidation payments can count. It's not the case if it's purely a Parent Plus loan. So if all you have underneath that direct consolidation loan is Parent Plus loans, you won't get any additional credit for the time when it was just a regular old pure Parent Plus loan. You could get additional credit for the time after consolidation if you missed a payment or you were on the wrong repayment plan, if it's after that consolidation. You could get additional credit if you have a direct consolidation loan that has Parent Plus and your own student loans. So if you have both, the consolidation loan could get additional credit for that underlying student loan, just not for that Parent Plus loan. Next slide. So to determine your loan types, right? Because we get a lot of people say, how do I know whether I have direct loans or not, or fell loans or Perkins loans. So you can do that at studentaid.gov. Studentaid.gov is the best place to start to manage your loans. If you don't have a studentaid.gov password, go get one right now. Do it. You can listen at the same time, but it takes a couple of days if you don't have one. But you want to have a studentaid.gov password because that's where you're going to go to consolidate, apply for PSLF, sign up for income-based repayment, all of that. And it's where you can get tons of information about your loans. So you can go to studentaid.gov and once you have an account, you'll be able to see your aid summary. You'll be able to load, scroll down to your loan breakdown section. You'll be able to like click and see all the loans and you'll see a detailed name. And each loan will say direct or fail or Perkins somewhere in the name. It will literally say one of those words. And if you have loans that don't say direct, that is your cue to know that you are going to have to consolidate if you wanna take advantage of the PSLF waiver. If they don't, if you have loans that don't say direct, they need to be consolidated if you wanna get PSLF for them. Next slide. So quick recap, take advantage of the waiver. You wanna confirm your employer is qualified. We talked about what counts as qualifying employer. We're gonna talk a little bit later about the tools we have for you to, for you to do that. We wanna, you wanna consolidate your loans if you need to, and you wanna get your PSLF form in by October 31st. Next slide. Okay, so we wanna make sure folks know about what happens when you consolidate because a lot of folks are going to have to consolidate to take advantage of this waiver, right? That's part of it, you gotta consolidate. And it used to be that consolidation had all of these big issues. Like you started at zero for PSLF and you started at zero for IDR, income-driven repayment forgiveness. 
We took that away for PSLF and more recently, we took it away for IDR. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. So we have taken out the biggest things of consolidation. So if you're still worried about consolidation and whether you should do it, we took out the biggest issues, which is starting at zero for PSLF forgiveness or income-based repayment forgiveness. But there are some other pieces you wanna know about. We just wanna flag so you're not caught off guard if they happen. So when you consolidate, you're essentially making a new loan and your monthly payment could change. It could go down, but it could go up. Because if you were on IBR before, on an income-based repayment plan before, and now you consolidate, you may no longer have a partial financial hardship and that could change the types of plans you have access to. And you may now only have access to more expensive repayment plans. So you wanna use our loan simulator and think about that. If you have unpaid interest or fees, when you consolidate, they're gonna get added to your principal balance because they're, they're gonna get capitalized and you're gonna start accruing interest on that. If you're working towards PSLF forgiveness, you likely don't care about that because that's just what's going to get forgiven at the end. Your new consolidation loan will generally have a new interest rate because it's going to be based on a weighted average of the loans that you consolidated. And again, if you're working towards PSLF, you probably don't care about that because you're just working towards forgiveness. And you don't have to consolidate all of your federal student loans. You can consolidate one loan, five loans, eight loans. It's up to you. You, don't, you can pick and choose which ones you consolidate. But once it's, once it's consolidated, once it's dispersed, you can't undo it. Next slide. So I mentioned briefly that we took an, another big sting out of consolidation with something called the IDR adjustment because you're not gonna start at zero for income driven repayment either. And I wanna dig into that because it also has some, the IDR adjustment also has some huge impacts for PSLF borrowers as well. So under the adjustment, borrowers are gonna be able to get credit if they were steered into long-term forbearances, right? And, that's, and for us, we define that as 12 or more months consecutive or 36 or more months cumulative. If you have one of these long-term forbearances, you can now get credit towards those for IDR. And if you certify your employment and it's PSLF eligible employment, you can also have that credit towards your 120. So this is going to help a ton of borrowers get closer to 120 or get forgiveness as well. But we're going to implement this later this year, automatically where possible. But in the meantime, you just want to make sure you have PSLF forms in for the time as you wait, because it's not going to be till later this year, or early next year, because I don't know if y'all know, but we have a lot going on over here in the federal student loan system. We're also giving credit for months spent in deferment prior to 2013, as long as it wasn't an economic hardship. I'm sorry, boop, boop, skirt. I said that wrong. Please let me clarify. You can get credit for months spent in deferment prior to 2013, as long as it wasn't an in-school deferment. And you can get credit for economic hardship deferments after January 1st of 2013. Again, you're still gonna have to certify employment. Next slide. So deferments for bears is in the PSLF waiver. So I just wanna clarify again, what counts under the waiver. So you can get long-term forbearances counted, 12 or more months consecutive, 36 or more months cumulative. Deferments prior to 2013, as long as it wasn't an in-school deferment. Economic hardship deferments count. We're also counting some military related forbearances and deferments. And if you happen to have shorter term forbearances, you can file a complaint with your servicer. So it's not automatic, but you can submit a complaint and potentially get credit for those. For every month of repayment that you want credit for though, you're gonna have to have qualifying employment certified as well. Next slide. So just a quick note about what to expect when you're expecting, because we are, many people are gonna be submitting stuff and you've heard things about um, that the PSLF servicer used to be a company called Fed Loan Servicing and now it's a, or also called FIA and now it's a company now Mohila where you've gotten letters about this and you're concerned. It's a normal thing, this transfer. I just got transferred, it's okay. It's not gonna change your interest rates, your terms, your conditions, the number of payments you have. Everything is still gonna be processed. So I don't want you to worry about that. And you may not get every, you just, and for those worried about how they make this October 31st deadline, we just want to make sure borrowers know you just have to do your part. Get your consolidation in, get your PSLF form in. Even if you don't hear back from us by October 31st, even if your consolidation loan hasn't been dispersed by October 31st, as long as everything is submitted on or before October 31st and you are later, that PSLF form is later approved, you are good. You have met the requirements of the waiver. You are not going to be held responsible because it takes us and our servicers longer to process everything. So don't worry about that, but don't wait. Don't wait. That doesn't mean wait till October 31st. That means get your stuff in now. Just go ahead and get it in so you don't have to worry about it. Next slide. 
Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the PSLF help tool. This is what you're gonna use to actually apply for PSLF. And so I wanna be clear that applying for, getting, taking advantage of the waiver, submitting your form, applying for PSLF, there's no different application for the waiver. It's the same PSLF form you've seen before, the same help tool. It's just that as long as you get it in now and you raise your hand for the waiver, you're gonna get your account looked at through the waiver logic, not through normal PSLF tools. So we're gonna look at it where, so if you wanna make sure we're not looking at your repayment plan or whether you missed the payment and you wanna get those, um, you wanna get all of those things counted, that's why you wanna submit now, submit now. And you wanna do it even if you're not at 120, even if you haven't been in repayment for 10 years, even if you've only been in repayment for one or two years, you could still benefit from the waiver and you wanna get your forms in now. Next slide. So we're going to talk about the help tool, but I also want to flag that we now have this handy dandy, very cool standalone employer tool. It's hooked up to the same database as our PSLF help tool. So it'll enable you to see, see in our system whether your employer comes up as eligible, right? And so it's freestanding, public facing. So you don't have to have a studentaid.gov account to use it as you do for the PSLF help tool. So just want to flag that. But when you get ready to apply for PSLF, you want to use the help tool, and we're going to talk about that now. Next slide. So this is what the PSLF form looks like. This is what the physical form looks like. And this is what you're going to use the help tool to generate. Next slide. So you can find the help tool at studentaid.gov slash PSLF, and you're going to log in with your studentaid.gov account because everybody now has a studentaid.gov account because they know that they need one to take advantage of the waiver. So you're logging in, you logged in, next slide. And the first thing it's gonna ask you about is your employment history. And this is the same database that's on the employer tool. So I just wanna walk through borrowers, walk you through what you're gonna need and what you might see so you don't freak out. So the first thing you're gonna need, the first thing it asks you for is because is your employment history. Cause that's what we need to know for PSLF. We need to know if you had PSLF eligible employer. For you to tell us if you had eligible employment, we need something called an EIN employer identification number, the federal EIN. You're gonna need the EIN for every single employer that you wanna certify for PSLF. You're gonna need the EIN for every single employer. You'll see here that we don't ask you for the name, the address, anything like that. We're asking you for the EIN and you're gonna need it for every single employer. So wanna make sure you know where to find it. Next slide. You can find it on your W-2 and box B, which you can see here highlighted in red. You will also find it on your pay sub, and you can find it by just reaching out to your HR department. But you're going to need the EIN for every single employer that you want to get credit for for PSLF. Next slide. So once you have that EIN, you're going to put it in, and a couple of things could happen, right? You could put it in, and a bunch of different employers could pop up. And this is particularly the case if you are a government employee at any level, because at the federal, state, and local level, government agencies a lot of times share EINs. So you can put an EIN and I work at Department of Education and I could put in the EIN and it also, and HUD will pop up, Ed will pop up, a bunch of other agencies will pop up as you'll see as an example, Employment Department 1, 10, 11. So if you see that, don't freak out, just pick the one that looks closest to your agency or department. So that's one thing that, that could happen. When you put in the EIN, it could pop up and where you see likely and eligible here in that um, orangey yellow font and that orangey yellow color highlight, you may also see something that says eligible in green. If it says eligible, you are in the best shape because that means your employer is already in our help tool in our database as eligible. We know it's a qualifying employer. Or you could see that likely and eligible, like that weird orange font, right? That weird orange color. And that just means undetermined. That just means we don't know. And this is because our help tool is really great and we work hard to update it every day and to get through it, but it's never gonna be perfect. It's never going to have every single qualifying employer or even every single employer that exists. So you may put something in and it's not going to pop up right away. I don't want you to freak out. It just means our, our help tool is not perfect. You still want to continue with the process. So it could say likely and eligible, just means undetermined. And you can help us out by submitting supporting documentation that shows it's a nonprofit and it does a qualifying public service or it's a government entity. It's okay. And you, there's an option for you to do that. It could also show up in red as ineligible, meaning we, we know about your employer and we think it doesn't qualify. We think it's a for-profit or we think it's a labor union or we think it's a nonprofit that doesn't provide a qualifying public service. And you may think we're wrong. We don't know we are completely wrong. And that has happened and could be true. And so if you get ineligible and you think that we are wrong, again, don't be discouraged. 
go ahead and continue with the process. You'll have to upload that supporting documentation, but it could still later get approved because we have been wrong. It's not perfect, but only do it if you're really sure you know you work for a qualifying PSLF employer or you're like, you know, 95% sure because no one's like, maybe you're not 100% sure, but you think so. Um, and then last thing that could happen is you could put it in and nothing could pop up. It may be like, is this really your EIN? Because we've never heard of this employer before at all. It's not in anybody's system. If that's the case, you're going to have to manually input like the input, like the address and things like that. And again, still continue with the process. You're going to have to submit supporting doc supporting documentation, but still it's okay. It just has to go through our employer adjudication process, which could take a little bit longer, but it is okay. As long as you get it in and it's later and it's later approved, you are okay under the waiver. Next slide. So you'll be able to put in the employers, all those things could happen. You can put in multiple employers at a time, however many you need. Then you're gonna click next. You'll get to this loan tips page where it'll tell you um, just information about loan consolidation and the COVID-19 emergency and things like that. Then you'll click next section. Next slide, please. Then you'll get to application details where it's basically just asking you, do you have 120 qualifying payments? Yes or no. You have to put the answer that aligns with what our system thinks. So even if you think you have 120 because you know about the waiver and all of that stuff, if our system doesn't yet think you have 120 because you haven't consolidated yet, you're still gonna have to put no. And it's okay, don't freak out. It's still gonna be looked at. It doesn't change how your, how your application is processed, but you do have to answer the question and you do have to answer it in a way that aligns with our system. Next slide. Then you're gonna to get to personal information and because you log into your studentaid.gov account, this is gonna pre-populate with the info, but if you do need to change it, you can go to account settings and do so. Then you'll click continue, next slide. Then you're gonna to get to review and save. So you're gonna look over everything you put in, make sure everything looks right, nothing you wanna change. You'll click save, next slide. And then you're gonna get the confirmation page. So if you put in employers and they popped up as eligible, you're gonna get a PDF that looks like that one I showed you a few slides ago for all of those employers. If it was likely ineligible or ineligible and it wasn't, or it wasn't in our system, it's already gone to our employer adjudication team. So don't worry about that. It's there, they have to figure that out now and they'll send it back to you later once it gets approved. But if you had a form that was eligible, now you get a PDF and now's the fun part because you got to sign it and get it signed by the employer. Every single employer you want to certify, you're going to have to sign, have to have a form that's signed by you and signed by them. So you're going to be able to download that and then you'll either have to mail or fax it in if you don't have Mohila as your servicer. Yes, I did say mail or fax. I know. Or if Mohila is your servicer, you'll be able to upload it directly to their platform. Next slide. So as I said, you're gonna have to have it signed by both you and the employer. So you just wanna make sure that you are aware that we just wanna make sure that you are aware of the rules for signature and what counts because you don't wanna have your form sent back on a technicality. So you can have, you can have a signature that's hand-drawn using your mouth pad or your finger and your signature pad, that's fine. You can have a scanned photo of a picture that was hand-drawn on paper. That's okay and you just like insert it onto that PDF. Or you can have a regular old wet signature where you print it out and sign it with an ink pen. And this is the rules for both you and your employer. All of those work. You cannot use a typed cursive font. So you can't just like go in Microsoft Word, pick out a cursive looking handwriting, type it out and insert that. That doesn't count. You can't use digital certificate based signatures. So like DocuSign or one of those programs, even if you have it or your employer has it, those don't count. You can't use those. You have to follow these signature rules because again, they will send your form back. This happened to me, believe me, don't be like me, be better than me. Next slide. And so then once you do that and you've raised your hand for PSLF, you'll then be able to keep track of your payment counts on the PSLF servicers website. So it used to be FIA, now it'll be Mohila. You'll be able to go in and see which payments are ineligible and why, which payments are showing up as eligible and which ones are qualifying, meaning not only were they eligible, but you also certified employment. And it'll just help you keep track of your, of your payments and your progress towards that 120. Next slide. This is what it looks like on Fed Loan. I just don't have a picture of Mohila yet, but it looks something like that too. Next slide. You can also check it out on studentaid.gov because again, studentaid.gov is a great place to go to manage your loans and you want to make an account. So you'll be able to see there, um, track your payments. And again, you can also see what type of loan you have. You'll see here, it says direct graduate plus. 
it says direct there. So we know it's already PSLF eligible. We don't need to consolidate it. We're okay. And we see that we, and we can count our PSLF months as well. Next slide. So information and resources, next slide. So the best place to go for information about the limited waiver is studentaid.gov slash PSLF waiver. It has a wealth of information. It has a ton of FAQs. So check that out. For the help tool, which is where you wanna to go to apply for PSLF, studentaid.gov slash PSLF. You can find general information at studentaid.gov slash public service. And you need to submit your form to Mohila and we you have this information about how to submit as well. Next slide. And if you wanna reach out to FSA, here's our social media info. Um, you can email or chat with us at um, any time um, using one of this one of these um, contact uh, numbers or email addresses. Sorry, a little bit tongue tied. Okay, so that is the end of this presentation. We are gonna start. We're gonna transfer over and look at some frequently asked questions to walk through using examples. A lot of the questions that we get and that many of you probably have. Um, from all of this information in this complicated program that we have created, which is PSLF and have tried to improve through the limited waiver. So we're gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Just one second. Okay, so, so one of the main questions that we get is, can I still benefit from the waiver if I'm not yet at 120 or if I haven't been in repayment for 10 years? And the answer is emphatically yes. Some borrowers may only get a few extra months of additional credit, but that's still, in, that's still closer to 120 than you were before. So yes, no matter where you are in your, in your repayment life cycle, get a form in, it doesn't hurt. We like to say, when in doubt, fill it out, because why not? It won't hurt you, just get the forms in and get them in ASAP. Um, we, got, we get questions a lot about the transfers, right? Like I'm at 118 qualifying payments right now. And so once you apply the waiver to my account, I'm gonna be well over 120. So am I still gonna get transferred to Mohila? And the answer to that is no. You're gonna keep your loans at Fed loan because you're so close to 120 until your discharge is processed. So we know it doesn't make sense to discharge you, to, to transfer you just to discharge you. So don't worry, you're gonna stay with Mohila and you may even get a refund if you made extra payments on the direct loans, but it had to be on the direct loans. And that takes about 16, six to 10 weeks after the discharge. Next slide. Oh, the I'm doing slides, sorry. Um, so we get, a, we get a lot of questions about, can I get credit for paid off loans? So I worked as a teacher from 2007, 2017. I paid off my loans in 2015. I paid off my undergrad loans in 2015. And then in 2018, I went to grad school. And so I took out graduate plus loans. After grad school, I went to the public sector. Am I now gonna get credit under the waiver? And if so, how much? So this borrower wouldn't get any credit under the waiver. And that's because they already paid off their undergraduate loans. So now they can't be consolidated. Those are done. So she can't get any credit under the waiver. And she now works in, pri in the private sector. So she doesn't work for a PSLF eligible employer. So she won't get any additional credit because those undergrad loans are gone. If they, if they still existed, she would have been able to get credit for the time as a teacher, but she paid those off and now she's not in PSLF eligible employment. So, oh, this is a visualization, visualization of the previous slide, sorry. My colleague Bonnie made these slides for me because she's awesome. And so I just had to catch myself up. So this is just a visual visualization of what we just talked about. So you can see that her employment, the qualifying employment is in, in green. So she was a teacher from 07 to 2017. And then she was in grad school or in the private sector from 18 on. So, and then her undergrad loans were with qualifying employment, but she paid those off. And so the grad loans, which are still in repayment, doesn't overlap the qualifying employment. And so that's why she won't get any additional credit under the waiver. So we also get, again, more questions about paid off loans. So you, we've had borrow, a borrower might have three fell Stafford loans from undergrad. And then they worked as a teacher from 2007, 2018. Oh, it's the same borrower. And then in 2018, they went to graduate school and took out several direct grad plus loans. Then after grad school, they went to the private sector. 
will they will they get PSLF credit? And if so, how much? So the difference between this borrower is they did not pay off their undergrad loans before they went to grad school. So this borrower can consolidate their fell loans and their grad plus loans and then certify their employment as a teacher. So that 2007, 2018, and they, and they will get credit under the waiver for all peers of repayment. And they'll probably get immediate forgiveness because that's going to be a more than 120 payments. Again, another great visualization. Um, you'll see here that the qualifying employment was 07 through 18, and then it was non-qualifying employment. But the undergraduate loans have been in repayment this entire time. And so because they have the, the 10 years, 120 payments, even though it didn't have to be consecutive, the entire consolidation loan, once they consolidate, is going to get credit based on those undergrad loans. And the grad loans will also get forgiven sooner if she can, because she's consolidating them all together. I hope this is making sense. Okay, we also get questions about what to do if the, um, if the PSLF help tool incorrectly states that your employer is likely ineligible. And remember, we talked about this as well, right? Our system is not infallible and we don't want people to freak out because it doesn't say right away, your employer is eligible, don't freak out. So if it says likely ineligible, again, it doesn't mean your employer won't be approved. And it just means we haven't made a determination. So we just call it undetermined and you should think of it that way as well. Still submit your form. If you have supporting documentation showing that your employer is eligible, submit that as well. There'll be an option right there in the PSLF help tool. Go ahead and do that, help us out, but don't freak out. As long as your form is later approved, you will, have con you will be considered to have taken advantage of the waiver. So what do you do if you put your EIN in the PSLF help tool, but it shows the wrong employer? So you might put it in and you work at uh, Fountain Public Schools, but it comes up City of Fountain. If that's the case, just remember that many employers in federal, state, or local government share EINs. And so you want to put the one that best, that's closest to where you work. If it said the City of Fountain and you do work in Fountain Public Schools, put that and just continue on and submit your signed form. A lot of entities share EINs. We recognize that it's okay. So what do you do if your employer is denied, even though it provides a qualifying service? So again, this is because our, we could be wrong, right? Like you think we're wrong, we've been wrong before. So still use the help tool and you're gonna have the option to up, and you're gonna have to upload documentation demonstrating that it's a government or not-for-profit that provides a qualifying service. So be ready to do that, but don't get discouraged. Use the help tool, submit that documentation and it will be looked at by our employer team. We got a borrower who asked, you know, I worked for a nonprofit from 2006 to 2010, but my employer destroyed the HR records from that period because of record retention policies. So how do I get credit for this time if they're not going to certify my employment because they no longer have those records? So if this is the case, I want to make sure folks know that we really, really, your holy grail is to get a signature. You want a signature. That's what we want to see, a signature from your employer. But if you absolutely can't get one because your employer destroyed the records or it no longer exists, right? Went out of, it went out of existence, then you do have the option to submit alternative documentation, which is W-2s or pay stubs or deposit records for those months that you want to get credit for, but you are going to have to submit something that shows that you were employed by that employer. We get questions about denied employers, right? I, you work for, borrow worked for Widgets Org, they all got approved, they, we approved their employer in 2014, and now we're denying it. What should they do to get PSLF credit? So, Non-501c3 nonprofits have to be have to provide a qualifying public service to be eligible. And this, if you think that it was wrongly denied, you go to the help tool, you submit that documentation that it's government, that it is government or a qualifying nonprofit, and then it will go to our employer adjudication team. Again, if you think we're wrong, go ahead and submit that. So um, one other thing that we're doing under the waiver is we're working to do um, matches so that people who work in federal government or who were in the military get automatic credit towards PSLF, but those things are still in the works. So even if you work in the federal government, you need to get your form in now. Don't wait for those matches, get your form in. Don't wait, they may not, they likely won't be done before the end of the waiver period. So go ahead and get those forms in, do not wait. So. 
Um, this is just an example of what a borrower's repayment history could look like. And you can see something similar to this in your student.gov profile, right? Because you're logging in, you're looking at your loans. And so we're going to assume this borrower has qualifying employment from 2005 to 2014. And we're going to try to figure out where they could get credit. So we're just going to walk through this. So they were in default from 2014 on. So peers of default don't count. So you wouldn't get any credit for that time. But they would get time for the repayment period. So from 4-9-2013 to 1-9-2014, those months, right? Because they were employed with qualifying employer. And they, um, they have some periods of forbearance, but it's less than 12 months. So they can't get automatic credit for it that we talked about. It's not a long-term forbearance as we define it, but they can submit a complaint to their servicer and try to get credit. So they wouldn't get credit for those automatically either. But all the places where it says in repayment, they would get credit and they also wouldn't get credit for the time in the grace period either because that's not a in being in repayment. Okay, so again, we're going to assume that the borrower has qualifying employment from 2010 to 2022 and we're going to look at where they're going to get credit. So this 313-2020 um, forbearance, that's the COVID forbearance. That doesn't count towards a long-term forbearance, but everyone can get credit for this already as long as they certify their employment. So they're gonna get credit for this COVID-19 forbearance, right? That's great. They're gonna get credit for the time and repayment. That's great. Then this is five months of forbearance right here from 8, 15, from 9, 14, 2013 to 2, 14, 2014. So we're gonna keep that in our mind. That's five, it's not 12, but it could add up to 36. Then we have another forbearance here that is, sorry. I'm confusing myself. Um, Ashley, I can jump in here real quick. Oh, great. You're still here. Perfect. So, okay. So for this one, all periods of COVID forbearance count no matter what. So just know any period that you were in forbearance after March, 2020 is going to count as long as you also have qualifying employment. That's what that first line is. Now let's jump to the second line. This five months of forbearance, we're gonna, we're actually gonna come back to that. Um, we saw this question in the chats. A lot of people will have single days of forbearance. This may have been times when they were changing their repayment plan. Um, those are gonna count. As long as you have a single day of repayment in a month and you have qualifying employment for that month, you're going to get credit. That last line there, that's 36 months of forbearance there. We see this a lot for people who were victims of forbearance steering. This person is going to get automatic credit for all those months based on the IDR adjustment policy we announced a few months ago. Now, because this person already met the 36 month requirement in 2010, that short forbearance back in 2013 is also going to count automatically. So all of this to say, even though this person has a lot of forbearance on their loan history, they are still going to get PSLF credit. They just need to be patient and wait for us to take time to take the time to update it. It's, it's going to be a while. They won't see this credit until probably February of next year, but they will get credit as long as they have qualifying employment. Thanks, Bonnie. Um, so just a reminder that you can go do a similar exercise and look at your own loan status history by going to studentaid.gov and looking at your student aid data. We also get a lot of questions about parent plus loans. So I know that was confusing. We walked through a couple of, of, of the differences earlier. So we have Mary. Mary worked in public service from 2000 to 2019. Now she's retired. She took out parent plus loans in 2008. She consolidated them into a direct consolidation loan in 2012. And her loans have always been in repayment status. Which periods would she receive credit for under the waiver? So she would only get credit from 2012 through 2019 because that's when she retired and went out of public and went and was no longer in public service. She was no longer employed. So she doesn't have enough to get the 120 for PSLF, but she could continue working towards IDR forgiveness, which does apply. The IDR adjustment does apply to Parent PLUS. And so she'll get credit for those Parent PLUS, additional credit for the Parent PLUS loans for IDR, which gives you forgiveness after... Um, 20 or 25 years, she can get that, but she won't have enough for PSLF visualization. As you can see here, she had the qualifying employment from 07 to 19, then she retired. So it was purely a parent plus from 08 to 2012. So she's not going to get additional credit under the waiver for that. She'll get all the time from 2012 through 2020. 
for PSLF because she was retired in 2020 and 2022. So that's the qualifying part right there. And then she'll get IDR credit for that entire period once we do that adjustment later this year, early next year. So you also have Fred, he took out loans for his own education in 1982. And like so many others, he still has, the loan still exists and he still owes $4,000. So then he sent his kids to school and he took out Parent PLUS loans in 2019. He still has 24,000 on these loans. So he has 4,000 education loans of his own and 24,000 in Parent PLUS loans. And he's been in public service since 2001. How much credit can he get and what does he need to do? So because Fred still has his own student loans, and because they were in repayment for the entire repayment parent, parent plus repayment period, he could consolidate them all together. And the credit based on those undergrad loans will apply to the entire consolidation loan, including the parent plus loan part. So he has qualifying employment the entire time he had outstanding loans for himself. And so he's going to consolidate them all together and he's going to be able to get forgiveness of all of it, including the parent plus loans. Okay. Now we're going to transition back for Q&A, and I am going to turn it over to Terry. Thanks, Ashley. So uh, now we're going to start the official live Q&A. I know a lot of you have been putting questions in the chat, and so we're going to uh, begin to answer some of those. We would just say uh, just to continue to use the Q&A function. And uh, we'll uh, turn it back to Ashley and her team to see if they can help you with your questions. Bye. Great. Um, so Bonnie and I have been furiously typing away in the chat, um, but I pulled up a couple of questions that I think came up several times or nitty grittier ones that we want Ashley uh, to answer. Uh, we have answered almost 100 questions, so I think a lot of you will have some good answers in the chat. Um, first question, um, there are some folks who were in public service, but were told to go into um, def deferment, so Peace Corps volunteers or AmeriCorps. Um, could you talk a little bit about their eligibility for PSLF and what they need to do? Yeah, so if you went into an economic hardship deferment for Peace Corps or AmeriCorps, you're going to get credit for that time. PSLF, I mean, AmeriCorps and Peace Corps service counts for PSLF. And because of the IDR adjustment, we're giving credit for economic hardship. So just get those forms in for your, get your PSLF forms in for your Peace Corps and AmeriCorps service. That, that's one piece. Um, if it was a forbearance that you went, went into and it doesn't, and it's not more than 12 months consecutive or 36 months cumulative, um, you're not gonna get automatic credit. You could talk to your servicer about that, submit a complaint, but that's a different process. But if it was an economic hardship deferment, you can absolutely get credit and the employment itself is definitely eligible. Great, thanks. Um, and this is a more general question. Um, can you offer advice for finding the different officials at different federal agencies who can sign off on PSLF forms if you're no longer employed with them? What's a general rule of thumb that people should follow there? The general rule of thumb is to start with the HR department. Um, it's a good question and we can um, look into that. Um, but in the meantime, right, if, if you're just trying to make sure you get take advantage of the waiver and you can't find it for an old agency, make sure you get it in for your current agency because you just have to have one form in by, by October of this year. And so once you get that in, you raise your hand, you're good, you're not going to lose any credit and you can get the other forms in later, or you could potentially wait for that match we talked about for federal employees. So just make sure you get one in. So if you have one agency you can get to, like your current agency, do that and you've raised your hand. Great. And we had other folks asking a related question. Um, so if they submitted the PSLF form for their current employer, but now realize they have other service from the past, that, that can count towards PSLF? Can they file it again to get credit for those, those other periods that they hadn't previously claimed? For a different employer? Yes. Yes, submit all, get, when in doubt, submit a form, get it all in, submit everything. Great. Um, how can you find the correct EIN number for a federal agency you no longer work for and no longer have your W-2s or other documentation for? You're gonna have to reach out, the, reach out to them and ask. Um, 
we don't have it published anywhere. We're going to think about whether we can do that. We have our best list, um, but um, the for, for starters, you're going to have to reach out and ask. And if you have the if you have one of the EINs for the current agency, I would just put it in and see if your agency pops up because I'm telling you, we all share EINs. I think Bonnie says one of the EINs has like 80 agencies on it. So try the EIN you know, and that agency might pop up for that EIN. Great. Um, so if a borrower has reached their 120 payments, do they need to continue paying on those loans until their PSLF paperwork is processed? Well, right now you wouldn't be paying because we're in the payment pause. So definitely not. And yes, you can choose like when you, you can choose to be in a forbearance until your um, PSLF form is processed. So no, you wouldn't have to, if you know you're gonna be at 120 and right now nobody has to make payments anyway. Okay, great. Um, and then a follow-up to that, if people find out that they've overpaid in the process of getting PSLF, uh, can they get a refund for that? And would it, it be turns, automatic? If, you, if it turns out you overpaid on the direct loan, so only if it was the direct loan part, you will get a refund. It can take several weeks for that to come, but it will come to you from the Department of Treasury, either by direct deposit, if that's how you paid your, paid your loan, or in a, by a check in the mail. And borrowers are getting refunds. So it's a good question. A lot of borrowers have gotten refunds. Great. Um, so I think a, a general question for folks is figuring out what kind of loan they have. Um, so could you share like some uh, key terms to look for when you're looking at your uh, student loan balance and what kinds of banks might have direct versus those older fell loans? So you want to go to studentaid.gov, right? And you'll be able to see your loan summary. And when you click on each loan, it will literally say direct or fell or Perkins somewhere in the title. And so if it doesn't say direct, that means it's going to need to be consolidated. Okay. It has to say direct. So that's, that's the first, that's the first clue. Um, in terms of, so for direct loans, you could have any one of our servicers. So it doesn't matter if your servicer is Nelnet or Osla or Great Lakes or FedLoan or Mohila or um, a missing one aid Vantage, or if it used to be Navient, that doesn't matter. Um, your FEL lender could be any of a number of lenders. There's a ton of them. So, but that, but many of these lenders also do private student loans. So you want to make sure that it is a federally backed student loan and not just a purely private student loan. But the best way is just go to studentaid.gov. You can also call your lender and ask them what kind of loans you have and tell them to send that to you. Um, but go to studentaid.gov and it'll literally say it in the title. Great. Um, and then we have one uh, clarifying question from somebody who worked at a nonprofit for three years prior to 2007 when the PSLF program was created. Um, is it correct that that three year period of time doesn't count towards PSLF? Correct. Okay. Um, and then are folks who have refinanced their student loans with a company like SoFi or Earnest, are they eligible for PSLF? No, unfortunately, once you refinance into the private sector, you lose access to federal programs. Great. Um, so one person on our call uh, completed their consolidation process today for all of their undergraduate loans, uh, but realized that um, they also have uh, graduate loans and they're currently enrolled in school. Should they have included their currently open grad school loans in the consolidation to get PSLF after they graduate? I would, but your pathway is a little complicated. So one, if you just submitted your consolidation, you have like seven days to stop it. So you can stop it. Now you will not, if the, if the grad loans are not, are, are, are on deferment, but I don't, if you're, some loans are on, I guess some loans could be on school deferment, some could be in repayment. You would have to opt out of that deferment right? And then you could consolidate all together and the consolidation loan is going to get all the credit based on the older loans that you have eligible. So yes, you could do, do this. Um, it may take a couple of extra steps. And if you're trying to do that, then you need to stop that first consolidation and then make sure the other loans are not on in-school deferment so that you can consolidate them all together. 
And then going forward, if you're working full time while you're in grad school, you want to try to get on an income based repayment plan going forward and you can continue, you can probably get a low dollar payment and continue working towards PSLF if you still have, um, if you still aren't at 120. Thank you. All right. Um, after the PSLF uh, waiver period ends in October and we're back towards the normal rules, uh, will only income driven repayment plans be eligible? Income driven repayment plans and um, the standard plan um, for a regular PSLF. There still is TPSLF, but that's an appropriations limited. So, yes, your best bet after the waiver ends and when payment restarts is you want to be on an IDR plan going forward get on an IDR plan, use our loan simulator, figure out which one works best for you. Great. Um, does Mohila send confirmation to folks that they've received mailed or faxed forms? Is there a way to get a receipt for that? Um, if you mailed it in, you will get something. If you uploaded it, you will. If you fax it, you won't get a confirmation. Um, and also, you know, we got a lot of people applying, so you may not get one right away. But just know that if you mailed or fax it in, if it turns out there is an issue later, um, which there shouldn't be because you got it in before the deadline, if something happens later, there's going to be the ability to dispute it with Mohila. We have a reconsideration process, and we have Bonnie, who was helping in the chat, our ombudsman, who is great, who can help you get the credit if for some reason something goes wrong. But I wouldn't worry, but know everyone depending on what, what way you submitted it, you may not get a confirmation and you may not get one for a while anyway. Okay. Um, once the waiver period expires in October, will the requirement of needing to currently work for an eligible employer at the time of forgiveness come back? Or can yes. people who, who have left still get forgiveness? Yes. Um, okay. Uh, do does participation in an employer student loan repayment program, such as the one that HUD operates, impact folks' eligibility for PSLF? Nope. We don't care who helped you pay your loans. That that does not matter to us. We're just looking at your loan repayment status, whether you were in active repayment, and whether you had the employment. The rest is between you and the folks and the program that you're in. Um. Who is um, the correct person to sign the employer person portion of the PSLF form? Is it someone in HR or can your supervisor sign? It's usually someone in HR, but some organizations have um, empowered other folks to sign it. Um, maybe they have a really small HR department or not, don't really have one. So um, it's, it's who at your organization has been empowered to say, yes, this person works here for these hours for this time and can sign it. Usually it's HR, but it could be different. Great. All right, so those were all the questions that I had pulled up um, before. I'm going to scroll through and see if I can pull out a few more for Ashley to answer for us. I mean, if y'all answered them all, that's okay, because that's why we're all here <laughs> together. Yes, people are typing in the chat that Ashley has answered their questions. So oh, sounds great. great. <laughs> um, would you be able to share any information about the average time that it takes to consolidate your loans or get your PSLF form process? It can take 30 to 60 days for consolidation. For the form process, it depends. If you haven't consolidated yet, it's gonna, your form is gonna be held until that consolidation goes through and you have direct loans, but still get it in, don't wait. You let that be on us. You wanna get your stuff in. So you may not hear, that'll be held. Um, it depends on if your employer was in our system. It depends on um, uh, like whether it's like ineligible or likely ineligible. Remember that has to go through our team. So it really just depends. But whatever the case, just know that you just have to do your part. If, even if it takes us a long time to do to finish your consolidation or to get to your form, that's okay. As long as you've done your part by October 31st, you have met the requirements of the waiver. All right. Uh, one situation from a borrower, they consolidated their loans and they're currently held with Fed loan. Um, 
when they uh, submit the PSLF form, will their loans automatically get transferred to Mohila? Yes. Great. Um, and then would you be able to talk a little bit about whether um, PSLF forgiveness is taxable and what the considerations are there? It's not taxable. Cool. And is there any end date to that or is that a nope. new policy moving forward? Nope. So under the statute that Congress created in 2007, PSLF forgiveness is not taxable. Some other student loan forgiveness is normally taxable. That was changed under recent legislation. So through 2025, I think it's not taxable, taxable but PSLF forgiveness has never been taxable. Um, and then are people who are pursuing teacher loan forgiveness programs also eligible for PSLF? It's a great question. We get that question a lot. So yes, and normally people who got teacher loan forgiveness would have to have totally different years for PSLF. You can't, you can't use the same time under the waiver. That's not the case. So even if you already got teacher loan forgiveness, go back and submit those forms for PSLF and you can use those five years towards your 120 for PSLF. Only under the waiver. So get it in now. Um, and then I have two questions for uh, students who are on. Um, one person just finished their undergraduate studies um, and have been working in public service, but have not made payments. Does this person count for PSLF? So that's unclear because, you know, we've been in the payment pause, so I don't know exactly when you left and when your grace period technically ended. So what I would say is just go ahead and get a form in. It doesn't hurt. Our best practice is submit a form every year or every time you change a job. And then at least, and then if they tell you you don't have any payments yet, that's okay. Just go ahead and get it in. Um, would working as a graduate research assistant at a university qualify? Um, Full-time graduate assistantships were capped at 25 hours a week for this person. Um, so, no, because that's 25 hours a week and we define it as, as we define it as 30 hours. But if you're doing five hours in a different job at a different PSLF and it adds up to 30 hours, it would count. Um, but your your employer is probably going to certify that you work 25 hours a week. And so it ha would have to equal out to 30 hours a week that they're certifying. So you can have make it up with five hours at a different employer that's PSLF eligible. Great. Um, and then could you repeat the process for cell loans to become eligible for PSLF? You have to consolidate into the direct loan program by October 31st. Okay. Uh, can we print the form and complete it by hand or do we have to use the help tool? You can, but we really suggest you use the help tool. So we make, so you, um, it'll have, once it goes through, it'll have a little code at the bottom and just makes it easier for processing. So we really encourage folks to use the help tool. Um, and then we have a borrower who's with, um, their loans are held by AidVantage right now. Do they send the PSLF form to AidVantage or so to Mohila? You, you always, the PSLF form goes to the PSLF servicer, that is Mohila. So no matter who your servicer is or it all, your PSLF form goes to Mohila. All right, I think that is all the questions that I see in the chat that aren't like personal questions that are thornier questions. Um, if people have specific questions about their student loans uh, that take a little bit more, more discussion than what we can do on the, call, on the phone today, who should they call to figure out what their options are and get personalized advice? So, oops, sorry, if it's, uh, I, sorry. <laughs> If it's about PSLF specifically, you want to call Mohila the servicer. If it's about 
um, your loan situation and you want to know more about your loan history or things like that, you can call your current servicer or you can call our FSA line. And you can also just look it up on studentaid.gov. But if it's PSLS specific, you want to call Mohila. Okay, great. Um, then I think the, the last question, and we can pass things back to, to our hosts, is just what follow-up can we get from this call? Are you guys going to be able to provide links or recording to our attendees? Yes, I believe you're going to get the recording and you already have the PowerPoint, but I will turn it over to Terry to, to close us out and answer any remaining questions. Thanks, Ashley. So uh, we are going to post the PowerPoint uh, in a couple different places at HUD.gov and we'll make sure Ashley team, Ashley's team has it available. We'll also post the recording so you will be able to access it. Uh, we are, uh, as part of our closing, have said, um, can I get the next slide too? As part of our closing, we'll, we'll uh, give you some links. Here's a couple links. Uh, if you have questions, you can submit them to uh, HUD Housing Counseling at HUD, at housing counseling at HUD.gov, and we will make sure those questions get to the appropriate people, most likely Ashley and her team. Uh, and then also you can get resources. Um, the webinar will be posted at, on HUD Exchange, um, and we will also, we also invite you to take a look at our newsletter, the Bridge Newsletter, which is all about housing counseling. Uh, actually, when I was listening to this, Ashley, I had a question or two myself, and one was you talk a lot about the need to consolidate in order to be eligible for the program, and I found myself thinking, are the reasons that people choose not to consolidate, are there disadvantages to consolidation? It's a good question. And so um, we think that there's never been a better time to consolidate. Normally there are there were big there were big concerns. The biggest concerns were that you would lose credit for PSLF forgiveness or IBR forgiveness. But because of the waiver and the adjustment, that's no longer the case. So the biggest things that borrowers may worry about, right, is that their payment could change. It could go up because they could lose access to some income-based repayment plans. Um, so they might want to evaluate that in the short term versus how long it might take them to get to 120. Um, their interest rate could change, their, their, their interest will get capitalized, but a lot of that likely won't matter because you're working towards forgiveness. So, um, you know, the biggest issue was really that starting at zero and we've taken that away. Um, so the other pieces is really just what repayment plans you have access to. And so you can use our loan simulator to just check that out before you consolidate. Um, and that you, your balance is going to look bigger if you have interest and fees because it's going to capitalize, but you just want to continue working towards that 120. Okay, thank you. I think that's very helpful information so people can kind of understand um, if, they, if they want to consolidate or what the advantages and disadvantages are. And we've got a pretty short turnaround time for the deadline in October. Is it possible to consolidate that quickly? So yes, because you just, the, it, it will take about 30 to 60 days, but all the borrower needs to do is get it in, right? Everything else is on us. Like we're not going to hold anybody responsible for the things that are, have to be processed on our end. So if you got your consolidation in and you're just waiting for us, you've met the waiver. You just need to get your consolidation in, get your PSLF form in. It doesn't have to be fully complete by us. You just have to do your part and you're good. That's great. That's great. Okay. Uh, so I was just, let me go back to uh, my final slides. I've uh, highlighted some resources. Can I get the next slide? So this is uh, specifically for counselors. You can get credit for this training. Uh, and I think probably you know the process, which is to check into HUD Exchange, look in the webinar archive, and you can find this by date or by topic. And then to obtain credit, you need to select the webinar and click get credit for the, for the training. And the, that takes care of our portion of this program. We are just delighted that Ashley could join us and that so many people have joined the webinar to find out uh, all of this really important information. I hope you found it helpful and useful. And I'm gonna turn it over to Steve for our final closing. Thank you, Terry. And thank you for that very informative presentation and Q&A session. In closing, I want to thank Terry, Ashley and her Department of Education team, and especially you, the audience. On behalf of everyone in HUD's Office of Housing Counseling and the Department of Education, thanks for taking the time to join us today. This concludes the presentation. You may now log off.